Let me crawl. Hello, this is Bhakta Padadas here live at Radhakund uh, during Kartik 2015. The date is November 15th, and I am sitting here with Madhavananda Das, who is so kind to share with us some of his deep insights over his many years of devotional service. Maharaj, um, the first question I'd like to ask you is because you have uh, such a wide <coughs> spectrum of devotional service in various institutions over the last 40 years, mm -hmm. I think many devotees will benefit from your perspective on living a progressive spiritual life. Mm -hmm. Can you distill for us what is your experience of having close intimate association with a Maha Bhagavat teacher, <coughs> such as Srila Narayan Maharaj, and how you transitioned to another spiritual master's shelter in another parampara? Mm -hmm. I began my spiritual quest um, probably when I was a teenager and grew up in a Christian family. And there we understood that the primary goal was to develop a relationship with God, to love God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. And that actually is a working definition of bhakti yoga. Because yoga means to link, but to link with bhakti, which means love and devotion. And that was the same goal or modus operandi in Christianity as well. <clears throat> so my search, even when I was an ordained minister, pastor of a church in New York, was to find out how to achieve that, who is God, and to make it possible to have such an intimate, powerful relationship. Because to love someone with all your heart and mind and soul and strength, that's, that's everything. And I would think you'd need to know that person quite well, and that they would be capable of accepting all of that from you. So naturally then one thinks that God would be the best person <laughs> to be able to, to reciprocate, to give, and to be loved so completely, because everyone and everything in this world is temporary. So I began my search, I spent many years in Christianity. My family was Christian. And, well, just to say very briefly, I was in a flat in New York City with a friend of mine who was a rabbi. And he was also looking for deeper inspiration. And we were watching a film about Gandhi, and Gandhi was quoting Bhagavad Gita. So I started reading the Gita after I bought a copy. And then that led to my research in Hinduism, and I met the Hare Krishnas ISKCON in New York and spent a number of years with them. And so inspired by Srila Prabhupada's writings in his books, I felt that his commentaries were like the voice of Jesus. Because as a sincere Christian, it would, the greatest ideal would be to be able to sit at the feet of someone like Jesus. And so, Prabhupada's commentary was like, wow, there was someone in this world who had that same spiritual authority, like Jesus Christ. It was such a tremendous, uh, illuminating thought to consider that there could be people like this in the world today. Wow. <clears throat> so I was very disappointed to learn he had already left. And over the course of the years, I heard, had heard about Srila Bhaktivedanta Narayan Maharaj and again I saw that same mood, same authority that comes through when someone knows God. There is a definite confidence and joy and ability to enlighten in someone that has actually has contact with God. <clears throat> And I felt that in Prabhupada, I felt that in Shilda Maharaj, and so I took shelter of him, started reading his books and communicating with him in 97. <clears throat> and
And he sent me to England, sent me to China, gave me sannyas in the middle of all of that, <laughs> and created a deep interest and greed, if you will, for attaining a goal of having a relationship with the Supreme Lord in the mood of the Brajbasis, especially the Kopis. Because when, when we hear about them, we hear about their loving exchanges, I felt that this is what I feel I'm looking for in my heart. Mm -hmm. That resonated deeply with me. Because it seemed like of all the different personalities that had relationships with him, the Gopis are definitely loving him with all their heart, all their mind, all their soul, and all their strength. They, they have they've left everything behind to be with him. So I'm deeply inspired. So when I came to Shilin Raj, I asked him for Gopi Bhav. Mm. I said, I want Manjari Bhav, mm. the maid servants of Radharani, and I think you can help me. <laughs> he said, yes, I will help you. So under his guidance for nearly 15 years, mm. um, we were able to learn more, cultivate the attitude, and understand more of the psychology of the Gopis of Vrindavan. And it awakened the greed in us to continue to learn more. Mm. So when he disappeared from this world, I, I had a very close relationship with him, as you alluded to. We were often speaking to each other on the phone and, and felt um, comfortable mm. with each other. Mm. I always revered him because he's guru. We never feel like guru is just some, some guy. You know, but there is a, a friendly relationship at the same time, a senior friend, a friend who's um, greater in every quality that there, there can be greatness in, but still friendly. Mm -hmm. so, so he was so loving and so kind and instilled in us the concept that we need to pursue our goal no matter what. And he instilled in us the, the idea that we should make sure that everything we do is connected to our goal. He always told me, make sure that you see that everything you do is connected to your goal. <clears throat> and my goal was Manjari Bhav, to be a maid servant of Radhika. So when he disappeared, I just thought, oh, you know, he brought me so far. And I couldn't imagine that, what would I do now if he were with him not here in the world to guide me. Even though I still feel him in my heart, and after he had disappeared, I could talk to him. Sometimes he'll talk to me, or in dreams. There's still communication going on. Even it's been, what, four years? Mm. Five years Five. since he disappeared, yeah, my goodness. Time goes so quickly. And so, as your question su suggests of coming to another uh, lineage. Okay. So for me, it wasn't a question of institution yeah. or group. It was a question of getting help and assistance to attain my goal. Yeah. That's, that was my only um, mo 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 motive to continue. And when I was in ISKCON for many years, they didn't like Gaudi Amat and called Shilin Raj all kinds of derogatory things, but that didn't stop many of them or me from going to him. <clears throat> and so within Gaudi Amat, they, some, not all, have a very, uh, I think, uninformed but similar prejudice to the traditional parivars or lines for the last that have existed for 500 years, particularly headed by Babaji's here at Radhakund and Govardhan. And believe me, it was the last thing I ever imagined is that I would be have close contact with, with them because I didn't think it was necessary. Hmm. <clears throat> but when I started to read the books of my Gurudev Shalananda Das Babaji Maharaj, because Guru is one, in many forms. It's like Shilabhati Rakshak Shridhar Maharaj used to say that we're in a school and over the years we have many teachers and sometimes the students that we're with change also. Because sometimes when you go on to the next level, 
It's a whole group of students, different. And we've experienced that many times as a Christian, as Iskan, and Goryamad. <laughs> so when I met Srinathar Das Babaji Maharaj, I realized he has the same mood that Srinathar Maharaj was instilling in us, mm. same mm. literatures and books, and I had an immediate connection with him. So for me it was simple. It just meant some change of cough. <laughs> But otherwise, I was continuing on to my goal. I realized that it was going to change things in the world for me. That the, the group I had been before, most of them wouldn't support me anymore. But I thought, I didn't come, and I didn't get this far, and I don't see myself in this world pleasing men. My goal is to please Radha and Krishna, Jugalkishore, and my gurus that will bring me to her lotus seat. So that's my objective. There was no contradiction for me. I don't see any contradiction to this day. I feel complete harmony in my heart with Prabhupada, Srinarayana Maharaj, and Baba here. Thank you, Maharaj. If I may ask this question um, just for def uh, defining more. So you received Diksha from Srila Narayan Maharaj. Mm -hmm. What is the difference or what is your understanding of having received a form of Diksha from him and then coming to Baba who, uh, Srila Nantadas Babaji Maharaj, who may then, you might consider your Prem Guru, I've heard you use mm -hmm. this term, can you describe what it means to come to mm. your Shiksha Guru, who then becomes your Diksha Guru, yeah. uh, how this works? Yeah, again, it's a matter of achieving the goal. That's the objective there. So, Diksha is a process. It begins with initiation and some mantras. So, Guru, each Guru, according to their lineage, may give different mantras. Most of the mantras are the same, but not always. So, um, the diksha, initiation, that Sri Narayan Maharaj gave me, it was valid, of course, there's no question of that. That's not even the point here. It's the fact that, as he would say, we've entered into the school of diksha. And so we begin our studies like any child does, learning how to write, how to write their name, how to do mathematics, all these things. And with Shilin Ryan Maharaj, we were taken carefully through the preliminary level, levels, you know, because purification is necessary in order to advance. <clears throat> Without purity of heart, we can't absorb these higher principles, what to speak of higher moods, transcendental moods. So it's a gradual process, and it depends on our own ability. So the mantras that I received from him, and then the mantras I received from Srila Natadas Babaji Maharaj, my guru here, were a continuation in this process. Hmm? And he himself speaks of it like that, of, of, of completing, of, of going further, going deeper. So the mantras that Bubba gives are more focused on the uh, individual personalities that we would be in interacting with in Radharani's service. So it becomes more and more personal. And so therefore, as we begin to identify our own spiritual natures more, then Diksha is a process of well, diksha, the word, comes from divya gyan, which means transcendental knowledge, and cha, which we can just roughly say is kleshagni, or the, the removal of unwanted things, of any blocks or obstacles. And the thing that cleanses our heart is transcendental knowledge. Krishna says when we hear his pastimes with interest, with attraction, he comes situates himself in our heart and begins to clean. So the removal of the unwanted things from our heart is something that he's doing. 
All I'm doing is trying to focus on my goal more and more. So for me, again, there's no, um, institutionally, it was a big change and I had to deal with that on my own psychologically. People that were my friends and were no longer friends. But it's, I think it's the price you have to pay to achieve such a rare, exalted goal. The Gopis had to give up their families, the Vedantic society, teachings, religion, everything is against their bhav with Krishna. And so it seems to me that similarly, we have to be willing to transcend everything. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, that's very <coughs> profound, Maharaj. Um, so with this uh, further continuation of Diksha that you received, mm -hmm. then that does that include Ekadash Bhav? And, and why and where does that lead you to? Uh, uh, or what yes. is the importance of this Ekadash Bhav? Sure. Well, this again is the d discretion of Guru, who will decide whether to b bestow that knowledge up upon us to help us it means that guru feels that we're ready for such information and will make sufficient effort to incorporate it into our sadhana into our practices um shlanarayan maharaj has given ekadash bhav siddha Pranali, to some of his disciples it's not widely known but especially amongst the sannyasis and those that were very close to him, know who he bestowed that upon. And that's at his discretion. And I had always prayed that he would also give it to me. But alas, he did, did not. So uh, it didn't mean that uh, he didn't want to help me. It didn't help me because he did. It just meant that in his eyes, he didn't feel I was ready yet for it. Hmm? And so his... Leaving this world caused a great grief in my heart, a great separation, wondering if I was lost again. Mm. And when and again would I meet such a personality? Mm. When again would I sit at the feet of someone like Jesus? Mm. Huh? Mm. An intimate associate of God. Mm. And I knew, because unless you have that, you can't do anything. Mm. There's very little you can do, mm. except try to maintain what you have achieved. So... When he, I'm losing the, oh, the oh, point, but oh well, about <coughs> Ekadash Bhav and Diksha, yeah, like how it's that it's mercy. It's just more mercy, because without knowing our spiritual identity, we maintain an abhiman or a sense of identity that's mundane, or in a general sense, I'm a jiva soul. I'm a spiritual being. I'm not this body, and. Over the years, you develop some detachment from material energy, you lose your uh, attraction, you can't be distracted so easily by the material energy after some years. You know, detachment comes by chanting the Maha Mantra. Even without guidance, it bestows that city, so to speak. But to know one's spiritual identity and for Guru to reveal something, this is really what we're praying for. Because if I'm going to become into the association of someone, then my relationship with them needs to be defined. So Guru will give the Pranali Ekadash Bhav to give some information to you that Srimati Radhika has accepted you and she's giving you this name. And, and if we're at least a little bit ready for that, then we'll, we'll feel that, yes, this is me. This is truly me. There's a harmony there. Because you can't imagine Radharani giving us an identity that's completely foreign. Because we are spiritual beings already. And we have a desire to serve her. And she has decided to accept that service. So she gives us a form that makes it possible to offer her that service. So when, when Guru gives, then you have you can have bhajan. Now I can meditate and now I can focus from a perspective which is personal, not theoretical. 
And like a child learns how to talk and walk and do everything else in life as we grow, as we mature, similarly with that identity given by her through Guru, we mature. Mm. And, and it may not be overnight that you achieve such a complete, full self-realization. <laughs> But it's necessary. It makes everything clearer, easier, and focused on the goal. <clears throat> so some have the idea that um, Siddha Deha then manifests spontaneously as one becomes qualified, say mm. through intensive sadhan, mm. bhajan, um, that realization of Swarup may just dawn in someone's mm -hmm. heart and they may identify with that Swarup. How common is that or is this process of receiving Ekadash Bhav Siddha yeah. Pranali from Guru mm -hmm. more of a practical way? Well, if we consider that in anything we do we need guidance from someone who knows already what it is we want to do. You want to be a musician, you need someone who's proficient in playing musical instruments. Everything is like that. And we need a parent so we can grow up as a child. And we need guru. Shastra is quite clear on that. So, in my heart, my spiritual development is definitely going on under the guidance of sadhu. Mm -hmm. Without sadhu, sangha, without guru, what? how much can we hope to achieve. Very little, I think. And if our greed is sufficient, then Krishna sends a guru. That's how we get guru. And so if that guru is so kind as to reveal more out of affection to help us, then I think, well, this is special mercy. Mm. And to have an opportunity for that is the greatest blessing. Mm. So it's... Uh, it's a simple thing, I think. <laughs> and, and obviously, the, uh, this kind of Siddha Deha revelation revealed by Guru has to come through a pure devotee. Yeah. Otherwise, there is problem of sahajism mm. or some, something that's artificial. That's I right. Because there's one thing that Shulana Maharaj taught us very clearly was the qualities of a bona fide spiritual master. They have no material attachments or desires, and it's something we can see. And they're quite proficient in Shastra and can answer any question and remove all doubts that we might have. Hmm? These are two things that we can observe in someone. And even a person who's not a guru can have those qualities. Well, we've known many people like that. But guru has, most importantly, above all, is that they're a self-realized soul. And they understand their relationship with the Supreme Lord. Now, how do we know if they have that quality? Because Guru awakens in us what they have in their own heart. What you have, you can give. And for spiritual life, I need to be free of all material attachments and desires. I need to be proficient in Shastra. I need the foundation of Tattva Siddhanta. And most importantly, I want to realize my spiritual identity. So if Guru has realized that, then they can awaken it in us. Mm -hmm. And this is what we experience. If you have a bona fide spiritual master who is a realized soul, they will help you realize your identity. That's a very real thing. Just like learning Shastra, like becoming free from material attachments and desires that every devotee experiences as they practice this process, saying the holy name and hearing how to guitar, serving the deity, etc. All things we do connected with our goal. We have a spiritual master who's a self-realized soul. Our spiritual yearning, the greed increases to such an extent mm. that we become ready for more. Mm. So. <clears throat> and so one who possesses bhakti can transfer and give bhakti. Yeah, I can't give anything I don't have. Yeah. Right? Right. Um, why do some institutions uh, appear to reject the idea of mm -hmm. Siddha Pranali? Well, I think every institution 
has its purpose. That's why it's been institutionalized. They've formed a group with a specific purpose. They have their statements of reasons for its existence, their mission statements, etc., all these things. And this is what they do. So, just like in school, and I don't mean to be uh, belittling or condescending in saying this, but when I was in um, early years, I was basically just taught how to write my name and begin understanding mathematics. And then we went through different levels of education throughout the years. And then in university, you learn things that you could not possibly comprehend when you were a child. So, and that happens because of your ability, because you're tested along the way, and you don't go on to the next level until you've satisfied the authorities of that level. And so institutions are like that. And I think the way to see it in spiritual circles is perhaps like, I see three categories of gurus or institutions. There's the inspirational, which inspire us. Then there's the aspirational, which focus more on the goal. Hmm? So we study that goal. And then there's the connecting. So where we achieve my goal. So I will have a guru or there'll be institutions or any association that first of all inspires me because I need to be inspired. And then when I'm inspired sufficiently, with some knowledge, some purpose, then I can aspire for something in particular. But, and then I need to achieve it. So in order to come into the service to achieve that goal of Radha and Krishna, then I need to be brought into their service. I need to be brought into the uh, company of Radha Rani by someone who has her ear who is in her service already. So I see gurus as inspirational, aspirational, and then connecting us. Yoga. When we want yoga, we need the yoga. So before the yoga can take place, a lot of education and purification and realization <laughs> has to take place. And so in this uh, process, Maharaj, I guess part of the, the goal then to achieving this Manjari Bhav that is your cherished desire, mm. uh, the process then is Raganuga Bhakti. Mm. And what is, I, I f from my own experience, uh, having followed Srila uh, Bhaktivedanta Narayan Maharaj, mm. feel that he gave so much greed to want to know <clears throat> what is Raganuga Bhakti mm. and to have some hankering for this Manjari Bhav, mm. yet I think he brought us to the doorstep and now how to enter in and mm. actually apply, if you can comment on that. Of course, yeah. He was making it quite clear what it is we're aspiring for and gave many super excellent literatures in that regard. Ugh, such a long list. One book that we've been appreciating a lot recently is Hidden Path of Devotion, where he talks about Loba, because Rag Bhakti is spontaneous devotion. That means it arises out of your heart naturally. It's nothing artificial, like in Vidhi Bhakti, we're following rules and regulations, perhaps out of fear of going to hell. But in Rag Bhakti, it's because I like it. I'm attracted to it. This is sweet. This is for me. <laughs> so, and he taught that quite thoroughly, very thoroughly. We have little confusion about what it means. But for something to spontaneously arise out of my heart, you can't uh, pretend such a thing. If it's not really spontaneously flowing from my heart, then I'm, I'm not familiar enough with it for that to happen yet. So therefore we need Sadhusanga, high class association, to bring us into the into contact with those with the spontaneous devotion, with their spontaneous devotion, for us to get a taste of it enough so that we also feel spontaneously attracted. And Srila Bhakti Thakur explains in his Jaiva Dharm that this begins, or the entry point into Rag Bhakti, is when I hear Braj Lila Katha from the lotus mouth of a realized Braj Rasik Vaishnava, <clears throat> an associate of the Lord. And they're speaking about Braj Lila 
from experience. Huh? And then that awakens the greed in me. Oh, I want that. And so coupled with this, then the Ekadash Bhav mm. is actually what activates our ability to, say, enter into this Manasi Seva, this Astakaliya Lila. Yeah. It's like if I'm in uh, studying science in university. And for many years, I, I, look at, I study all the different formulas and scientific principles of physics. And then at some point along the line, we're able to per perform experiments directly. Mm -hmm. We're, we're given, given all the elements necessary to perform an experiment and all the machinery and apparatus that are used in such experiments. We're trained now. And so now you perform the experiment. And so, after a level of advancement, and Guru decides these things, who can say that Guru is giving too soon? Because Guru decides. This is a self-realized soul. So if they decide, then no problem. Because this is the thing about Gauranga Mahaprabhu and Radhikas. They don't consider your Adhikar, mm. just your greed. Mm. This is the thing that Shilohar Anandamara spoke about so beautifully for many years in the Hidden Path of Devotion where we could be full of lusty desires and all kinds of mundane attachments, but if some greed has been awoken, us, awoken in us by some exalted Vaishnava, then you begin the process of rag bhakti, mm. because it was awakened in you. Mm. And he always told us, if loba is awakened in your heart, your life is a success, because now everything can follow. Mm. So, so, as you see, it's... I have no contradiction in my life. <laughs> it's just how to get my goal. That's it. Yeah. And <clears throat> I mean, tell me if um, I'm being redundant here, but what is then the essential um, importance of receiving Ekadash Bhav? Say, even mm. at what some would consider an early stage, the stage of Bhajana Kriya, this, mm. you know, or somewhere along our developmental path when we still have anartas, yeah. what is the benefit of this Ekadash Bhav? Oh. Well, everything depends on how much time and energy we, we give it. If I'm in school and I don't give much time and energy, I don't learn very well. So similarly, with Guru, such as the Vaishnavas, if we don't give our practice much time and energy, mm. we don't advance very quickly. So when Guru gives Ekadash Bhav, again, it's a matter of giving it time and energy, mm. of cultivating that identity, that Abhiman, which is given. Like when you get a job, they give you this position and a title, and now you need to fulfill it. Because we've, we've accepted that you're qualified, you're sincere, and we think you can join the team, so to speak. And um, Radharani accepts our greed, our, our desire to please her and serve her, and she gives us an identity which is appropriate, like Sri Rupa Goswami tells in Upadesha Marita, in a mentally conceived form which is suitable for their service. Mm -hmm. So Guru Dev tells us about that mentally conceived form that we're going to conceive of in our form. Conception means it's just a new idea, and I'm developing it like a fetus in the womb from conception goes from two cells to four cells to eight cells, etc. So it's a, a baby which is then born from the womb. So similarly, um, that needs nourishment, everything that's proper for it to develop and grow. So the, the Siddha Deha and the Ekadash Bhav that is given by Gurudev because of the acceptance of Srimati Radharani. And Guru is not making this up. A proper Guru is not making this up. It's coming directly from Radharani. Guru will pray to her, and if she accepts, then he will tell us. This is, and I'm, I'm sure there's cheaters. There's cheaters everywhere. It's Kali Yuga. But a bona fide Guru is taking this direction from Radhika herself. <clears throat> and it's so helpful. Because so now you have something to work with. Mm -hmm. That's the point. No? Yeah. Otherwise, I'm t it, it's just theory. But at least, even though I haven't realized that sw swarup, I'm still. I can understand that that's who I am. Hmm? So. And and begin to identify with your eternal nature and form and 
and yeah. actually have some attraction and attachment mm -hmm. for it. For because it's natural. It's natural. In our heart, you will feel, yes, this is me. This is me. And it's always been that way. In Madhurya Kadambani, Shula Vishnu Chakravati Tattakur, he explains that when we achieve higher stage of purification and development in our sadhana, in stages of ruchi, asakti, and then into bhav, but as we go along, we are realizing more and more of our spiritual nature. And we can look back on our development and we will realize that these elements that are directly connected to my spiritual identity we're always there because we're the same person. But now we're exclusively focused and acting upon our nature, which is in connection with Radha. And, and that it's said that it's the unripe stage moving into the ripened stage. That's all it is. Matter of being ripe. Mm. Much more. Because mm. the mango that's ripe is the same mango that was green. <laughs> so. and, and what uh, the gap between, say, Nishta and then a sakti or bhav. Can you say something about that? Like <coughs> what it means to come to the stage of nishta, but then what it takes to go from nishta to a, a sakti or rati or... There uh, seems yes. to be a big leap there. Well, it's a... Uh, <coughs> I don't know if how much we can say personally about what stage we're in because in our own personal development, we may not feel like we've advanced very far. But the mercy of Guru and Krishna are causing us to taste and realize many things. The devotee always has humility as is is an intrinsic part of their nature. And this helps us to understand that any advancement that we make is coming only by their kripa, by their mercy. So, in nishta means that we're steady. And as explained in Madhuri Kadamani again, it's nishtata bhajana kriya. Nishta means nishtata bhajana kriya, that I'm steady in my bhajan. Mm -hmm. And anishtata bhajana kriya means I'm not steady in my bhajan because I'm more attached to worldly things than I am attached to my spiritual goal, which makes my spiritual practice unsteady. Simple. So therefore, in the stage of nishta, it means that my bhajan is strong. Mm -hmm. To whatever degree, it's stronger than the other thing. Mm. <clears throat> and ruchi means that I have so much taste in it that I have no interest in anything else. Even if some other mundane thing that I used to be attracted to comes my way, I can reject it and bring my mind back to my goal. Mm. So it's a matter of of being absorbed. You know, if, you're, if you want to be a doctor at some point in your education, you give up a lot of other interests that you might have been carrying with you simultaneously. <clears throat> and so, in our devotional practice, it's the same thing as we mature. Maharaj, this will be, I think, the last question. I really appreciate the depth you've gone into here. Um, these are just some details about the transition uh, you've gone through, say, coming from Gaudiya Mat into <coughs> now a, a traditional Parivar, Nityananda Parivar line. Um, is it true that one would relinquish the Brahmin thread and, in your case, you relinquish the cloth of sannyas mm -hmm. to further your development. Can you just say something about this? Sure, yeah. Yeah, that was a very traumatic time. Because for 28 years I wore saffron cloth hmm. and sannyas for seven. And it's true that in the traditional part of ours we don't wear Brahmin thread. Hmm. But as Srila Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Maharaj explained, um, the saffron cloth and the Brahmin thread were actually introduced by Srila Bhakti Santa Saraswati Prabhupada for very good reasons. Srila Sridhar Maharaj explained that from his point of view or what he understood that his guru had uh, accepted the Brahmin thread and saffron cloth into their line, he introduced it, 
to show, he said two things. First was to show the smarter Brahmins, who were very much against him, that, uh, that anyone who has a natural interest could take up this process. You don't have to be born to a Brahmin family to be a Brahmin. A Brahmin can be born in any family. It's by quality, not by birth. So these were the considerations. And, and to also show that purification was necessary for spiritual development. Shilshira Maharaj explained that that was the reasoning behind it. But um, traditionally, in Mahaprabhu's movements, or all the branches of his tree, they went beyond Varnashram Dharma. And therefore, no one was wearing Brahmin threads, and everyone was wearing white cloth. Hari Bhakti Vilas discusses these things about wearing red cloth. But that's not, even to me anyway, it's not important. Because Guru gave me saffron cloth, and then Guru told me to put on white cloth. If Guru had told me to put on purple cloth with pink dots and whatever stripes, I would do it to please him. Because he's helping me on my way to achieve my goal. But it was a, I understood what it meant socially in the eyes of various institutions. And I understood that, that that would definitely be something of a severance of my connection with Gaudiya Mahat. <clears throat> but I thought, oh, I'll give up all of it. Because I didn't join, I didn't come to Prabhupada and accept his books to become a member of ISKCON. And I didn't come to Srinarayan Maharaj to become a member of the Gaudiya Mahat. And I didn't come to Srinathas Babaji Maharaj to become and another sectarian consideration as a traditional parivar, or, you know, whatever. He's a self-realized soul, a Mahabhava with Gopi Bab, and he's helping me realize my identity. That's all I know. The rest of it is just circumstances. Because in the spiritual world, if Shilinarayan Maharaj is a maidservant of Radharani, and Baba is a maidservant of Radharani, then they're not divided up into whatever institutions they came from in the material world. I mean, there are different groups, but you know, if you're in the group of Lalita or you're in the group of Vishaka or with Rupa Manjari or Rati Manjari, and, you know, your own Samaj, your group, they're, because they're intimately connected to you according to personality and service and prampara. That's prampara. The Manjaris mm -hmm. in my line that connect to Ananga Manjari, Rupa Manjari, and we feel a natural connection with them. <laughs> yeah, Maharaj, that's wonderful. We can, we can uh, conclude things here. It, it sounds to me as if there's no question of ever rejecting a guru. It's, no. it's, it's uh, comprehensive. You're, yeah. you're accepting a greater mm. family and love and yeah. shiksha and diksha. And that it's, um, like you said earlier, yeah. about uh, guru is one, Yes, ultimately. Inspiration aspiration and connection and we all go through this process and we have gurus in each category thank you for your time oh, madhavananda oh, das maharaj thank you dada <laughs> i'm very happy to all right share these things very nice thank <laughs> you i'm sure everyone will benefit <laughs>